first tell me what is ego? And explain to me what you think ego is. Identification with the body, with the material world, something like this. Mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah. Something else. Could so be. Came to the body, a way to deal with the reality. You you went to. A way to deal with, with, rea with reality. With, with, maybe? Well, the world. Yeah. Let's let's uh, let's ease up on the reality <laughs> thing, huh? <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. You know. Uh, you know, there's a million ways to think about this. Every philosophical lineage has its ways of talking about these things. Um, I once wrote a song that went, I have the ego of a lover, and it's easy to see. The pain of separation is sweet to me. <laughs> so if you're going to be uh, if you're going to be involved in the path of love, you assume kind of a phantom ego. There's a, there's, because with, there's love and there's lover and beloved. It's a relationship. But in some lineages, they talk about how there's a merging. Uh, there's only there's a oneness. My friend Swami Sachinandan Swami is here, so I'm being very careful about what I say, because he's going to get me later. Um, you know, personally, I don't think about it much. Uh, I found that I had a lot of issues, like self-hatred and shame and fear and and selfishness, and grief, a lot of stuff. And I've, I kind of realized that that stuff colors my experience of daily life. So I just try to work on cleaning that stuff up. I don't think about whether it's ego or not ego, you know? Uh, it, it's, that's just mental masturbation, really. You have, to, you have to find out who you really are. And it's, you're not going to find it here. So just do some practice. Don't think about it. And try to treat yourself well and other people well. That's the advice that should never be given. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, OK. But I found that most of my hating my ego or trying to kill my ego was, was in my case, was, was emotional self-hatred. That it really wasn't about freeing myself from delusion. It was about that I hated myself. So I wanted to destroy myself. I wanted not to be here. But reality is completely different. You're completely here. And in order to be fully here, sooner or later, you have to learn how to be good to yourself and get the things you need so you can flourish and grow. You have to eat. You have to usually have a place to sleep this, and, and clothes to wear and you know things like that. So you can do the practice that you have to do to find real love. And, um, Ramana Maharshi said that asking the ego or the mind to kill the ego is like asking the thief to be the policeman. There'll be a lot of investigation. No arrest will ever be made. So, good luck. Oh, hello. <laughs> Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I'm here <laughs> with the brave young man here ah, okay. who wants to fight it oh, with oh, you. Oh, oh. Give the kid <laughs> um, the mic. Let's hear what he has to say. Okay. <laughs> so because it seems like uh, he wants to fight with you, I have to just tell you that um, I'm feeling really grateful to be here. I came yesterday from Czech Republic, eight oh. hours by train with this small little boy. Thank you. And ah, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> 
It's a big joy for me, and I just want to tell you that uh, it's great that you're bringing mantras and chanting to the Western world and bringing it for many people, and uh, you are helping opening heart with love. So just thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you know who Pema Chodron is? She's a beautiful Buddhist teacher, an incredible being. I learned a lot from her. We were doing some workshop thing together. And uh, she was doing the morning and I was doing the afternoon. And in the morning, somebody stood up and said, Pema, I just want to tell you how much I love you and how wonderful your teaching is and this and that. And she just said, well, thank you. It's always good to hear good things about yourself. <laughs> so, thank you, you know. <laughs> I don't have to go, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. you know, that's bullshit ego. Yeah, thank you. I sang in the Czech Republic, you know, a few years ago. Well, maybe 10 years ago. Yeah, and he wasn't born either, or he wasn't born, yeah. It rained the whole time we were there. And then they, I sang in this church, and they were showing us the church beforehand. We went up in the balcony, and there was this small little organ in the balcony. I was just about to touch it like this, and the woman said, oh, do you see this organ? Mozart played this. Hey! <laughs> Whoa, Mozart played it. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, my question is about the meaning of mantra or mantras. Um, I work as a yoga teacher and I um, started playing the harmonium and singing mantras. And when I did my second teacher training, I had a teacher from India and she told me that it's very important if you sing those mantras, you need to explain your students what you're singing and what the meaning is. Um, <laughs> so I was wondering, <laughs> because I read that you, or I noticed that you, you don't explain <clears throat> what we are singing, what the meaning is, and I also noticed in my, <laughs> in my own classes that it, um, I feel like if I don't explain it, the people get more touched in a way or yeah if, they open if, up more if you don't explain it if i don't explain it well because you're not giving them something to think about that's why look you know there's this there's these candy bars in america one is called mounds and one is called almond joy almond joy is just like the mounds but it has two almonds on it and the commercial for these candies says Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. <laughs> That's kind of my answer to your question. <laughs> okay, let's get serious. Seri if you want my, this is, first of all, unfortunately for you, you're talking to me. <laughs> and I have my way of doing things which is not the way everybody does things. There are, everybody who, all the different lineages have their own methods, their own practices. They, they, they teach and share what's, what works in their lineage to give you yourself back and, find, and get you into real love and find, you know, free you from suffering. Each lineage has their own way of doing that. So, that being said, for me, the real meaning of all these mantras is the same. The name is the name of that one that lives within us as our own true nature. It's the same in every being. It's the same everywhere. It's that one in which we all live, and that lives within us also. And those, all these mantras, all these names that we sing are mantras, name, and they're all the names of that that beingness, that place, that vast presence. And that's the way I look at it. Now, 
I was once asked to sing at a teacher training, a yoga teacher training. And so I get there and I've got the harmonium out, I'm all ready to sing. And one of the teachers stood up and addressed the group of, I mean, the main, the yoga teacher addressed the trainees. And in the room, all the, they had all the Indian posters of the gods and the goddesses, you know. And she pointed to all these things and said, if you don't know who these goddesses are and all about these gods are gods, you'll never be a yoga teacher. I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> I couldn't get out of there fast enough, but unfortunately, I couldn't get out of there at all. I had to sing. I put the blanket over my head. I just, what a horrible thing to do to somebody. That's the way I thought about it. So, because from my, the way I, the way I share chanting is the way I do it. There's no philosophy behind it. You sing, there's no philosophy behind it that you have to be thinking about, let's put it that way. You sing, and when you notice that you've been lost in dreamland and thinking and imagining and remembering and planning and blah, 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 you come back to the sound of the name. And then you're gone again. And then you remember, oh, and you come back. And then you're gone again. And the more attention you pay, the more you notice how quickly you get gone. And then you start coming back more quickly. And gradually you get more familiar with being here and not being taken away by your thoughts and emotions and memories and physical pains and all the stuff that pulls us out of ourselves. So for me, it's a very experiential thing. And back in, in India, in the temple with Maharaji, there were the, the Hare Krishna, uh, the Vaishnavas from uh, Brindavan. Maharaji had them come up and they would sing Hare Krishna around the clock from like five in the morning to like 11 at night, every day in shifts. It wasn't a, an endurance test like we would do it. But, and we used to sing with them all the time. And then one day, one of the, the Bengali kirtan rallas kind of tried to seduce one of the Western women. And Maharaji found out about it. And in no time, they were all loaded on the back of a truck, driven down to the train, sent home to Brindavan. So one of the Indian people said, Baba, you just kicked out the kirtan rallas. Who will sing now? <laughs> the Westerners. Oh, shit. This was terrible news because the little room where we sang was around the corner from where he used to sit. So when we were singing, we couldn't see him. And seeing him, staring at him, looking at him, salivating over the beauty of the body and the blanket and all, and all, the, uni see, all the beauty in the universe was wrapped up in that blanket. My eyes did not want to leave that body. It was difficult. It was, I couldn't turn away. It was just too beautiful. Every, you know how it is when you fall in love for the first 13 seconds? <laughs> That's what it was like all the time. And so now we were banished to, to this room and we had to sing. And not only that, we had one instruction, sing. Nothing about how long. When can we stop? Can we stop? You know, what do we do? You know, it was horrible. But all day long, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare. It was like nails on a blackboard. And so your mind, you know, you start, you, you're asking yourself, to, your mind to pay attention, but it's just, forget it, you know. I started reliving my life, you know. Yeah, I remember when I was born. I was little. Yeah, I went, yeah. And then you go, and you know. But all the time you're thinking, you're singing, you see. Thinking, thinking, and oh, I remember my girlfriend back in America. Hare Krishna. And it gets, you know, Wait a minute, she broke up with me. Hare Krishna. Yeah. 
So days, I don't even, weeks. And what was even worse, hanging from the ceiling was a big microphone left over from World War I. And it blasted our chanting, our beautiful Western ridiculous sounds to the whole valley. And you could see the women in the field when they were take, picking potatoes, they go like. <laughs> oh my. But, you know, and I would try to like, I, the bathroom was like in the back of the temple. So I would, I would get up and I pretend I had to go pee and I would walk facing the door to the back of the temple, but I would move like this to where Maharaja was sitting, like I would go, and he'd see me, ah, down, go. So I go to the back and I try it again on the way up, you know, I'd look, be looking this way, but I'd be walking this way, you know, ah, down. He wouldn't let me come, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was like. However, now this is just my experience, if you ask somebody else, I guarantee you, you'll get a different answer. But after like days and days and days of this, of doing this, and going through every possible imaginary space and thought and memory, my mind just gave up. It just gave up. And... The mantra became like home, and it came very sweet, and it was just like home, and it was going on, and thoughts would come, and they'd just go, mm, and there was nobody thinking them. It was like a bird flying through the sky, or a cloud. and I, and. I don't even remember if I felt like I was singing, but the mantra was going on. And all there was was this deep, wide, beautiful, peaceful, loving space. You know? And so, because he forced me, you see, we sing for an hour or two, and we think we're hot shit, you know? But we don't really go through we keep changing the channel, you know. We don't watch the whole movie, see how it ends. We don't, we don't go through the, 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 the austerity, the fire of going through all these states of mind and letting go and keep, keeping, keep coming back again and again. But Maharaji forced me to do that. I would have never done that. Never in a million years would I have done that. But he forced me to do it. And as a result, yeah, you, this is what you get. So he never told me what the words mean. He never told me to learn the words. He never told me what they mean, what to do, how to do it. He never even told us how to sing. Like, you do it this way or you do it that way. And it just happened. So what can I tell you? I can't tell you anything different. I can tell you, do it. Do it and do it and do it more and then do it more. And then when you feel that you don't want to do it, that's the best time to do it. <laughs> and keep doing it until you find what you want because it's in there. And if you don't look, if you don't do what's, what, what's required to overcome the vasanas of the mind, the way the mind just flows in these habitual directions all the time. If you don't overcome that, you'll never find happiness. If you don't do it, it's not going to get done. That much you have to understand. Now, there's no hurry. I mean, we got, we, this is, you know, forget this life, just enjoy. But you can't, because it hurts. 
When Buddha came out of the jungle, the first thing he said was, whoa, stuff hurts. There's suffering. That's the, that's the seal of this world. There's suffering. And there's no escape from that suffering in this world. You either get what you don't want, or you don't get what you do want. And there's very little in between on that level. So, whatever way you approach these practices, just do it. Find the way that you can fool yourself into getting into it. You know, whatever it takes. If you don't plant the seeds, nothing will grow. And we are planting seeds every second of every day. Every thought is a seed. Every action is a seed. Every word we speak, every feeling is a seed. So we're always planting seeds. If we don't start planting the seeds of what the things we really want, of the things that will give us freedom and happiness and joy and real love, where do you think they're going to come from? And that's the good news. So, whatever way you think about practice, whatever it means to you, do it. Do it while you can do it. Because when you get old, oy, shit hurts. It, it gets harder and harder. Uh, you know, I heard that when I was young. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah I, get, I get time. I'm young. I'm not young now. And it's harder and harder to practice. I'm sorry. <laughs> Really, I am, but that's the way it is. Hello. Where are you? Oh, wow. Here. Where are you? Yeah. Well, you probably gave the answer to my question already with your last uh, answer, but I'll ask anyway. Maybe you have another um, idea to it. How, would you, how do you experience um, chanting a mantra with a kind of Western melody compared to chanting it with a traditional Sanskrit intonation. Is there a difference for you? Or would you say it no. simply doesn't matter? What are you trying to say? That I'd sing in a Western way? <laughs> mm, I thought so I'm singing like an Indian guy. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I'm doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. There's so many people um, saying, ah, it must be done this way. And well, yeah. You know what I don't we say know. in New York, right? <laughs> you know, you got to find your own way. If it, if it jives with what some group tells you and you like that, fine, enjoy. I don't like that. I'm my own group. <laughs> It's because I hate everybody. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, when I first started singing with people, I sang the melodies and things that I had absorbed while singing in India. You got to understand, I wasn't... I wasn't gathering material for my career because I was never coming back to the West. When I went to India, I gave everything away. I was never coming back to America. Never. And Maharaj, he himself actually got my visa extended. He, I, you know, and he kept me there for two and a half years. And then just before two and a half years was up, he looks at me and he says, go back to New York. Well, I, Mom, I'm just learning Hindi. Too bad. You have attachment there. You have to go. So my point was, I wasn't learning things to bring back to the West. So when I came back to the West, I just started singing what I had been singing. But, you know, I'm from New York. So as time goes on, the melodies started changing. I, with, there's no thought behind it, believe me, I'm not that smart. I just sing. And when a melody comes, if I like it, I sing it. If I don't like it, I don't sing it. I'm very selfish. So I don't know how, you know, certain mantras 
Now, these, this, this, these are the mantras of the divine name, of the holy name, of the sacred name, and the names of God. These mantras are for everyone. As far as I understand that you don't have to be formally initiated to do this practice. There are mantras that are so-called lineage mantras that need to be transmitted to you by a teacher. And then you need to you learn how to do it and do it that way. You know, I, that never happened to me, so I don't know what to tell you. So I just do what I like. And you're here. <laughs> so. Thank you. You're welcome. It was a long journey for the mic to get here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Katie, for your presence and your song. I um, it's been honored to hear you live here today. Uh, your song, Mere Guru Dev, uh, I heard for the first time in December last year. And I had not heard about you before, and I started singing with your voice. And when you sing, Samar Pan Hai, at that time, I just burst out crying. For one and a half hours, I couldn't stop. I couldn't understand what's happening inside me. But the journey and that you shared about your guru, that was quite moving uh, in that context. My question here is that you mentioned that we have a shadow side, which sort of... Don't say had. Have, have. 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 <laughs> present. Present. Tense. Have, yeah. Yeah. We have a shadow side. And uh, when I was crying this one and a half hours, I was trying to afterwards make sense of it, like what your voice was doing, and I was trying to sing in your tone, in B minor, and the G note with some open. Like my throat was opening at the same time, and previously I couldn't even speak loudly. And suddenly I'm sort of, not screaming, but really singing your song, really high-pitched. It was very, very moving for me, and later on I was, I was trying to make sense what happened. Can I make sense of these emotions? Can I make sense of the shadow, which is probably dissolving a little bit? And in your journey, how do you witness such experience and how do you make sense of them or do you make sense of them? I can't so make I can... sense of anything. I, I don't think about it. Make sense of emotions? Make sense of experiences that are beyond the mind? People ask me all the time things like, what do, you, what do you experience when you sing? How am I supposed to know? You know, I, my job, my practice is paying attention to the name, to the sound of the name. Anything else, just let go. I don't write it down, I don't think about it, I don't analyze it. You do your practice and you live. That's the way I think about it. And you do, and you, you, you invite into your life the things that help you feel better about yourself and about others. But as far as making sense, that's a, that's a, that's a big job. Not for me. So, you can't, you know, there's so many things that happen, so much stored in our subtle bodies in our so-called emotional hearts and our emotional bodies. So chanting actually allows those things to, to go away, to dissolve. The repetition of the name. Maharaji said, Ram Nam Karne Se Sabhur Ho Jate Hai. From going on repeating these names, everything is accomplished. That's a really big statement. And he knows what he's talking about. And he said that. Now, if I really believed that, I'd be locked up in my room chanting 24 7 365. You'd never see me. But to the extent that I do believe that, I, it, it, it uh, 
energizes my practice, you could say. But he said this, from repetition of the names, everything is accomplished. So if you really believe that, I mean, if I had real faith, I talk about faith all the time, you know, I think I'm such a, I got so much faith, but I hardly, I can't even believe what he says in a deep enough way to actually, for my life to be transformed completely. Yeah, a little bit, it's, you know, just enough. But, uh, so, don't try to make sense of things. How can you do that? Live. Keep going. Don't stop. You know? Keep moving. Thank you. Hello. Where are you? Yeah. Hello. Oh, oh. Hi. Hi. I have one question. When we start to sing again? Um, 2000 and... No, I mean now. When we start to sing now. Yes, that's we what I'm talking together. about. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> 2090 is the next time I sing with me. Um, we'll see. Maybe we'll sing more. But, uh, but you know, okay, calm yourself. Calm yourself. <laughs> you know, yes, last night we sang, and tomorrow night we'll sing again. And this is called a workshop where we talk about things and we get to unravel some of the knots in our minds and, and clear out, clear the path a little bit for ourselves. Because everywhere I go, oh, you can't, you can't follow me? No, oh, I'm sorry. I could speak Hindi. <laughs> yeah, I know, you don't speak Hindi either, okay. Um, well, then I don't know what to say, but I find this very useful. And it's the same, every country, every city I go to, people ask the same questions. They have the same issues. Now, you wouldn't think a German person would have the same issues as a Brazilian person. They look so different, but they have the same issues. I'll wait while she translates. Anyway, the point is, for better or worse, I feel this is useful for people. Okay? And so, unfortunately, I'm the boss. It's just a question. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. So the answer is maybe we'll sing before we go home. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Here? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> There's so many hands. Oh, yeah. Hi. Here. Hi. Uh, um, as a child, I was singing a lot and dancing a lot, expressing myself, and then I lost it over the years, and I'm rediscovering that uh, over the past years. and that I still feel there are some blockages sometimes of really fully expressing and speaking in public, singing, dancing. And I wonder how your path was like to really discover your authentic voice to speak from the heart and to sing from the heart. You know, there's a story about this old jazz musician. He's like 90 years old. He's one of the greatest musicians. Everybody knows him. And so this reporter goes to talk to him and says, you know, what was your greatest concert ever? And he said, hasn't happened yet. <laughs> you got it? Um, <clears throat> I'm too dull to worry about those things. You know, I just sing. And um, I feel close to everybody, so I don't get scared. I'm not trying to do anything for you, so I don't fail. <laughs> you know, you don't get off, you don't get off. That's your problem. I'm singing. You know, there's nothing at stake. Um, you know, we're here. I'm singing. You leave, you come. That's good. Thanks. You know, there's, no, um, I, there's nothing at stake here. I'm not trying to entertain you and make you feel anything special. So I, I can't fail. There's no, you know. When you do all those things that you mentioned, 
for the sake of your own heart, it won't matter what anybody thinks and you'll never be afraid. What's to be afraid of? Well, we're afraid of ourselves. That's the main thing. So, but, you know, so just keep doing until you, you, you lose that. You have one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, come on, you know. No, you can ask everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, thank you. <laughs> the pleasure. <clears throat> Is it? Partially it's because, you know, there's nothing, I'm not, I'm just singing, you know, I'm not trying, so it just comes out. It, it's funny you mention that. The first CD I did was um, called One Track Heart, and I can't even listen to it because I hear my mind. I was trying to do something, you know, it was my first CD, I'm going to make a CD, you know. Ugh. It's horrible. Other people like it. And they oh, so I like it. And I like it. Yeah, yeah. But I hear my mind in it, you know, so I can't stand it. From the next one on, it was like I got really stupid, and so that was good. Get stupid. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Where are you? Here. There. To Where? To your left. Oh, hi. So I've been listening to the Pilgrim Heart podcast, uh -huh. and I feel like I've already heard every question and every answer, at least Imagine once. me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really nice. I've even heard what you're saying before. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'll listen to that one too. <laughs> okay, you will. Yeah, okay. But I was wondering if you could tell us a little story about Sidima. Story about Sidima. Yeah, I know. I heard you. Sidima was Maharaji's great disciple. She and my Indian father, Mr. Tewari, were, as far as we know, were his were, were really great disciples of his. And uh, Ma Sidima was married, and. Uh, she was a great devotee of Krishna. She used to go to Vrindavan and, and um, when her husband died, her husband also became a devotee later on in his life. And when her husband died, she just moved into the temple with Maharaji and another Ma, Jivanti Ma, the two Ma's. And they served Maharaji for many, many, many years. And we never saw her. You know, she was always in the back, you know, in, in the culture, the women are in the back. So one night in Brindavan, we were sitting out in the courtyard in the middle of the night, late at night. Maharaji was on his cot, and we were sitting around him on one side. And these two ladies came out and sat down on the other side. And, you know, I knew it was Siddhima and Jimandima. So Maharaji looks at us and goes, oh, who are those ladies? And I said, they're your ma's. Nay, nay, who are those ladies? Uh, I said, they're the mother, like the goddess. Nay, 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 who are these ladies? I said, I don't know. He said, in Hindi, he said, Radha Sita Neha. Aren't they actually Radha and Sita? He was he lived in the real world, let's put it that way. And he was cutting through my mind. Ma was so beautiful and she took such care of us. We, the Westerners are so crazy. Yeah, um, we are so crazy. But we would go after he left the body, she stayed in the temple and she just lived there and people started coming to see her. And more and more and more and more people came and she was, I think she hid herself 
even better than Maharaji hid himself. Because she, anybody would come to ask her, and she said, oh no, I, just ask Maharaji, go ask Hanuman. She never took credit for anything, healing and all these things that would happen, these so-called miracles would happen all the time. But she never took it serious, took it personally. You know. It was, uh, I had a, a really kind of a long-term, very special relationship with her. When Maharaji left the body and a group of us Westerners went back to India. <clears throat> and we, uh, we got there just after his body had been burned. And then after that, we went up to the mountains to Kenchi for a week. And um, I went to sleep the first night. And in the morning, there's a knock on my door. And I open the door. And uh, there's this young girl there with some fruit. Uh, and she gives this to me. She said, this is from Sidney Ma. I said, oh. She said, last night she had the first dream of Maharaj since he died. And you were sitting there singing to him in the dream. Ah. At least I'm doing the right thing in my dreams. <laughs> in her dreams. <laughs> so, she was extraordinary. I mean, <clears throat> she was the perfect devotee. A hundred percent. Anything is just extraordinary. Yeah. There's a beautiful book. Yeah, written about her by her disciple, Jaya. Very beautiful book. You can, it's on Amazon too, I think, right? So you can read about her too. We were so lucky to have time with the old devotees after Maharaji left the body. We were so lucky, so blessed, boy. And they were so patient with us, believe me. And she knew everything. She, I mean, just like Maharaj, she knew everything. She didn't say that. She just, just pretended she didn't know. <laughs> but she knew, and we knew she knew. And she knew we knew she knew, so that was enough. <laughs> she was love incarnate. I mean, the sweetest, but she could you know, if something happened, she needed to be, she could do it. it was, I mean, she, it was amazing. She was the The temple that I was the pujari of, it was called Vindyavasani Durga Devi. Vindyavasani means the form of Durga who lives in the Vindya Hills, which is this area in India. And she's a form of Vaishnavi Devi. In other words, she, there's Shiva Shakti and Vishnu Shakti. Shiva Shakti has certain characteristics, but v Vishnu Shakti, Vaishnavi Devi, doesn't take any sacrifices. You can't even break a coconut, supposedly, on in a Vaishnavi Devi temple. So, Vindyavasini. So one day in Allahabad, Maharaji was in Allahabad, Siddhi Maharaji Bantima. And they decided to go to the Durga temple called Vindyavasani Durga Deva, the, the Durga who lives in the Vindya Hills. So they drove to the Vindya Hills and they were halfway up to the temple, but they had gotten a late start. And so by the time they would have gotten to the temple, it would have been closed. So halfway up, Maharaji says, stop the car, stop the car. So they pulled over and they stopped. Maharaji gets out of the car Siddhima was sitting in the back seat. He goes around, he opens the door to where Siddhima is sitting. He sits down on the ground and takes all the things that they were going to do, the, the puja, the worship at the temple. And he, he worships her. And then the temple was built in the courtyard. So that temple really is Ma's own form too. Siddhima's own form, Vindyavasana and Durga Devi.
Yeah, she saved my life more than once. I was always jumping off cliffs. She would just move the cliff, and I'd fall flat on my face. She was, I mean, you have to be one to really know one, but from, I can still say that it appeared to us that she had become completely one with Maharaji, who was, of course, one with the universe. So, she didn't want anything, she didn't need anything. It was just love, compassion, kindness. It's inconceivable when you meet someone who doesn't want anything for themselves. I mean, it's just different. It's just different. You'll know when it happens, but it's different. It lets you be you. You don't have to be anything for that person. With Maharaji and Ma, we didn't have to be good little boys and girls. They knew everything. What's the sense of trying to pretend you're good when you know who you really are? <laughs> and they know. And they always find these little ways of showing you that they know, you know. Without making you feel judged in any way. It's always with a laugh or a, a smile. I learned to chant from the ladies when I was uh, living in the temple in 1972 during the Durga Puja time. Maharaji allowed all the ladies to come from the town and spend the 10 days in the temple. In those days, mostly the women, married women, had to stay home in the kitchen. And have you heard of Ananda Maima? Ananda Maima used to come to KK's house, which was two houses down from where Sidney Ma lived. And she would come to KK's house and visit, and then she would climb up on the roof, up on a ladder, and, and walk across the roofs into Sidney Ma's kitchen to visit with her. Because in those days, Ma was, Sidney Ma wasn't, she was a young married woman, so she didn't go out much. So Nanda Mai would come to see her. <laughs> when I wrote, um, so my partner, I used to have a record company, and my partner in the company was at a conference, and. Uh, <laughs> One of the people at the conference was uh, the head of a, of, a, of a publishing company, a book publishing company. And uh, he knew about me, so he asked my partner if I'd like, if would Krishna Das like to write a book? And uh, we could offer him, make an offer to him. So, uh, so I said, no, no, I don't want to write a book. I was afraid to write a book because, you know, when we talk with people like this, we can discuss, and if, you, if I say something you don't understand, you can ask. Or if you say something I don't understand, I can ask. But if I write it in a book and you read it 10,000 miles away and you get the wrong idea, that's not good. So I didn't want to write a book. So when he made that offer for the book, I said, no, 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 I'm not going to write a book. So about a year later, uh, there's another conference, and the same guy tells my partner, he said, you know, that offer is still on the table. Uh, and I said, no, I, I don't want to write a book. But if they double the money, maybe I'll think about it. It was already a lot of money, but you know, I figured there's no way, right? You know, I said, double the money and then I'll do it. Well, they doubled the money. 
And I went, oh, shit, now what? So my friend Nina, Nina Rao, was, was on her way to India. So I said, you're going to be with Ma. Ask Ma, tell, tell Ma I'm not about this book thing, and tell her I'm not writing it without blessings. Because I didn't want to hurt anybody I, through misunderstanding. So Nina goes, is with Ma, and she says, says about the book. So Sidney Ma says, I have, she closed her eyes for a minute. She said, Ma, you know, there's this thing about Krishna in the book. She closed her eyes for like a full minute. Which she, and then she opened her eyes and she said, I have to think about this. And then in the 10 days Nina was there, she never mentioned it again. So I had a friend who was acting as my book agent. So I said to him, forget it, I'm not doing the book, you know, because she didn't say anything, I'm not doing the book. He said to me, let me get this straight. You're not, you're throwing all this money away because some woman in India didn't say something? <laughs> I said, yeah. He literally went crazy. He walked around New York City for three days like, huh? Like a homeless person in the street, huh? So then about six or eight months later, I was in India. I was in the temple with Ma. And I'd been there for weeks, and we had talked quite a few times. And so she was getting ready to leave, and I was going to spend another week or so on the temple. So when I was with her, she said, you have any questions? I said, no, no, nothing. You sure? There's nothing you want to ask about? I said, no, nothing. You sure? I said, no, there's not. Oh, the book thing. She says, yeah, you write a book. <laughs> so I went up to my room and I spent a week sitting on this uh, porch up above the temple kind of and I just looked out at the temple and I saw everything you know that had happened over the years and because it all happened there it happened there and I just wrote it down like that and that was the book but she knew you know it was strange Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Some questions about your singing. When you are singing, or while you are singing, what do you feel? What do you experience? Do you feel connected with the people around you? Uh, do you imagine the presence of the Godhead for which you are singing? For Hanuman Mantra, do you imagine the presence of Hanuman? Krishna Mantra, do you imagine the presence of Krishna? What is your, your inner... Keep going. Give me some more options. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know. All I'm doing is chanting, paying attention to the sound of the name. Maybe some of those things happened, maybe they didn't, I don't remember. It's not my job to think about that stuff. It's my job to remember the name. Anything that comes through, let it go. Because one of these days, nothing will come through. And that will be good. And I'd be filled, fully present, and one with the space, with the presence. Everything else that comes has to go. So let it come, let it go. Um, when I chant, if you're in insist that I say something, I am singing, I feel like when I chant, I move deeper into the presence of my guru. And that presence is not thoughts, it's not experiences, it's not one thing, it's just a feeling of being and presence. There's no stuff in it. 
you know, is full and empty at the same time. And that's all I could tell you. Tick. Okay. First of all, and, and if I did tell, say something, I mean, if I was, some people, you know, if I said, oh yeah, I have this experience, then you'd be looking for an experience when you chant it. That would be a disservice to you, a disservice, because that would keep you stuck somewhere. You have your experience, you do it your way. It's your paper bag you have to fight your way out of, not mine. Yeah, hi. You're on. Hello, Krishna Das. Hello. I am Gabi. This is my first concert with you. I hope you live through it. Uh, the problem is, the problem, my, my English is no good. You I'm speak sorry. very, okay. very hurtly and no clearly for me. This is, okay. I'm a little tryst. I'll do the best I can. I don't understand. I will do the best I can to talk to yes. yes, you. Yes, I think this is a concert, but it's a workshop. Yeah. With many words. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you, can you come tomorrow night? Yeah. Repeat slowly. Tomorrow night we sing. Tomorrow? Tomorrow night. Ah, tomorrow. And yes. I'll, I will put you on the guest list. Hey. You can come tomorrow for... It's clearly tomorrow in which time? <laughs> it's just then, it's also here. Who, who speaks German? You can tell her 8 o'clock tomorrow. Uta. 8 o'clock here. The answer is in Deutsch. Ah, yeah. Thank you very much. Danke schön. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Here. Hi, where are you? Where are you? Here. Ah, hello. Hi. Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, I was just wondering when we when you were speaking about um, the state of just being compassion and being love and not taking anything for yourself anymore. And I love, I love that. And at the same time, we know that we also kind of need to take care of ourselves and need to take things for ourselves and sure. set boundaries and... Sure, um, sure, sure. So yeah. I wonder, how do you find the balance? There's no balance because mm -hmm. you're not being compassionate, you're not being kind, you're not doing that. Real compassion is just natural. There's nobody doing it. This is not a goody-goody trip. You know, we're not out here, we're not the Salvation Army. You know, we're spiritual seekers. And the Buddha said, in the whole universe, you will never find anyone more deserving of love and compassion than yourself. So if you, you are not separate from the universe, if, you're being, if there's compassion, you're, involved, you're also part of that. It, it's got, it comes from experience, not, not, not mind, mind, mind. I gotta be this, I gotta do good, but I shouldn't take from myself. You have to eat, eat. How difficult is that to understand? You have to eat, eat. You don't have to eat enough for 20 people, but you can eat to, to, for your own health. If you're not healthy, how can you help anybody? And you can't even do practice if you're not healthy. So we have to take care of ourselves as best we can. There's no conflict at all. None at all, there's no conflict. The conflict is when you start thinking that you're different than other people. 
which is what we do. We think that we live that way. So that's not real compassion. That's what the Salama used to call idiot compassion. <clears throat> you think you're doing good for others and starving yourself to death. That's, that's neurosis. And neurosis takes over the spiritual practice very quickly. It's very sneaky. Yeah. And what if, um, what if um, others are taking advantage of, of your compassion? You have a baseball bat? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> give me an example of someone taking advantage of compassion, your compassion, or some make something up. But give me a. Mm, um, let's say um, you feel like. Uh, like you feel that somebody needs something and you want to... <laughs> That's a really good question. Um... <laughs> it's just us folks. You can... Yeah. I'm just thinking of a situation where um, you're not really clear about what you want and then you're doing something, but you realize maybe... It's not coming from, from your heart, but you're just doing it. And, um, and it's not really good for you. Mm -hmm. And this, this other yeah. person might ask more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. M many of us have problems with boundaries, setting healthy boundaries for ourselves. There's nothing wrong with setting a healthy boundary for yourself. Um, it means you care for yourself. It means you, there's some, you want to do good for yourself also, don't you? I mean, not just for everybody else in the world. You would also like to feel good. So we have to learn how to do that. But many of us, our boundaries have been uh, uh, just trampled by our parents and by different situations in life. For instance, I, I never learned how to set healthy boundaries because my mother just used to crash over them. You know, I, I, I tried to lock the door, she'd break the door down if she wanted to. You know, I needed to protect myself. But that's not healthy. That's out of, you know, that's already a, a neurotic thing. It's necessary, but not healthy, right? So to set healthy boundaries means that you you, you see things more clearly, you know, you recognize that you know I guess for us it's hard to tell when it's an emotional kind of thing, you know, we want to help somebody we want to, you know, we want to make them feel good and we're almost giving ourselves a way to do that. And a lot of that comes because we want to feel good about ourselves also. So we're thinking, you know, it's hard to see that when you're really in it. But a lot of the times you can, if you look, if you slow down, you kind of sense there's something going on in there that's like something fell into the soup when you weren't looking, you know. You can taste it, but I don't remember anything falling in there. But it tastes weird. And that's, just, that's something you learn as time goes on, how to be more aware of your own, our own um, uh, needy uh, motives, you know? Because a lot of the stuff we do with other people and in relationships, all relationships, not just romantic relationships, are based on a need that we have for something. And um, so once you're in that kind of emotional give and take thing, that's when you get taken advantage of. And because you're, you want something from that person, and in order to get that, 
you've already given yourself away and now that person's going to take more and, and it gets pretty messy. So I used to tell my Indian, Mr. Tuari everything about my life. So one time I had been talking about my girlfriend for about an hour and he's, uh oh, oh, TK, TK, listen, oh, yeah, 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 okay. When I finished, he looks at me and said, my boy. He was always saying that to me, my boy. He said, relationships out of business. He said, do your business, enjoy, enjoy, do your business. But love, you know, love is what lasts 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So we're all so hungry for love. We'll do anything, we'll give anything away to get it. And you can never get it that way because it's who we are. It's not what we get. You can't get it from anybody. But we don't know that. We might be able to say it up here, but when it gets into the nitty gritty, we fall in love and then we're fucked. <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes you just have to say what you have to say. You're welcome. You know, so I hated him when he said that. It took me like months to get over that. <laughs> I, I hated him when he said that, but he was so right. We are so, we just, and there's nothing, we're human, come on, let's face it. And we're not, we're, we're human beings. We're full of all kinds of things. But our hearts are good. But we don't know that. So we're always looking for somebody to give that something that makes us feel better. And that's where we lose our boundaries. That's where people take advantage. And that's where we get hurt. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard to let somebody be who they are, especially in a relationship. You know, we want them to be who we want them to be. But they don't want to be that because they, they're already themselves. How can they be who we need them to be? It's very difficult. <laughs> So then we start getting angry and manipulative and they get pushed around and they get angry and, you know, and then you're in a real relationship. <laughs> but to be in a relationship where you really let the person be who they are and that there's affection there, I mean, you don't always necessarily get what you want when you want it from that person, but it's okay. You know, it, that takes a little bit of a little bit of growing up. You know, and growing up is hard for us, really hard for us. We 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 don't want to grow up and take responsibility for our actions and for making ourselves happy. We you know, it's not easy to grow up. But um, good luck. Thanks. Yeah. Katie. Yes, ma'am. I'm Sarah. right here. Sarah, ma'am, where are you? Right here. Where? Oh, hey. Uh, do you take requests? No. I won't make one. <laughs> the Neem Karoli Baba chant? Maybe. Maybe? We'll Maybe a, one day. We'll take a vote later. Yeah, I was thinking about it earlier. We'll see. Here you go. I know her very well, so I can be a jerk to her. Oh, who else? You, what are you asking a question for? You can write to me. Give somebody else a chance. Yeah. Yeah, right there. Oh, sorry. I'm not supposed to do that. And while we're waiting for that mic, we have right here. Go ahead. Hi. Hey. I feel super honored to be here tonight. Um, I have a question, a quote came to mind. Um, I think it's from the Bible. Um, to be 
in the world but not of the world mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you can share any sort of thoughts on how to be in the world thank you well you know there's a, a great poet saint of Indian named Kabir and he wrote he wrote many extraordinary song poems and one thing he wrote is, Kabir goes through the marketplace, but neither a buyer or seller is he. So to be in the world means to not, to be in the world and not of the world means to not want, not to be, not to be fooled by thinking you can get something that you need from the world. I mean, you can get clothes, a house, a refrigerator, a television, a partner, you know, all those things. But happiness, you can't buy or sell that. So to be in the world, but not of the world, means to be here, but not buying or selling, not engaging, not thinking you can get something where it, you can't get it. And then you're happy. So, uh, There's a lot more to say about that, but I think that's the basic thing. You know, we have this fantasy that one day we're going to find some. There's a button we're going to find. We're going to push that button, and everything's going to be okay from now on. Not going to happen. <laughs> Sorry. That doesn't mean that there isn't a button, but it ain't out there. But we want it to be out there because that's what we know. But the button is looking through your eyes right this second. It's not what you're seeing. It's what's looking through your eyes, your own true nature. Your consciousness, your awareness, your being. That's the button. You already have it. But... All right. Hi. Yeah. Where are okay. you? Hi. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, when you said you walked into the room and you've seen your guru for the first time, you said it became true, it became real. Yeah. What is the it? What is the it? The it. How would you define it? Very simply for me, it was Maharaji. That was the first time I felt him. Uh, and I mean, very simply, yeah, I walked in the room, boom, because I was looking for him and I didn't know that he existed. But I had that longing very strongly. And then there it was. It was, ah, it's, it exists, really. I, but I didn't know it was him. I didn't, and who is he anyway? That's a whole other story, right? But he's not that guy in a blanket. But that was, the, that was it. That was, you know, the guru for me. He's still really busy, you know. He's doing, you know, there's, there's a book just came out called Whispers in the Heart. And there's stories of people who met Maharaji who have never met him physically. They either came in dreams or they had some experience. It's a whole book of people. And there's more. It's like a hundred books could be written like that. So it, these great beings are always available, but we don't know how to find, how to look. That's, that's the issue. Right, right now. But we're too busy. Our, our thoughts, our emotions, we're, we're glued to that stuff. So that's why chanting is such a great practice. You sing, and then you notice you've been gone for an hour. While you've been singing in a room full of people who have been singing, you've been just, da -da, oh, and then you're back. 
right? Every time you come back, the glue that sticks us to those thoughts and those emotions and those habitual stuff, it gets a little thinner. But it's really thick. So it takes a while before we can feel that. But think about it, okay? So here you're singing Sri Ram Jai Ram, Hare Krishna, whatever. And you're thinking about, you know, what you're going to make for supper tomorrow night, right? And then you, you realize that, oh, I haven't been listening, I haven't been paying attention, right? How did that happen? How did that moment arise where you, you woke up from the dream that you were in and recognized that you haven't, that even though you've been singing and hearing the chant going on, you haven't been there at all, you've been somewhere else. How did that happen? We know that nothing happens without a cause. Cause and effect. An effect becomes a cause of the next, and then that cause becomes, it's cause and effect, effect and cause, cause and effect. If you woke up, you must have planted the seeds to wake up at some point in some lifetime, or you would never wake up. You wouldn't even think about it. And of course, thinking about it isn't in any way. <laughs> think, and then just think of all the people in the world who don't give a shit about this stuff. It's not that they don't want to be happy. It's not that they don't want to be free of suffering. It's not that they don't want to find real love. It's that it just doesn't arise in them that it's even possible. The seeds haven't been planted. For better or worse, we have planted some seeds or we wouldn't be here. So we could give ourselves a little credit once in a while. Where'd she go? Anyway. Yeah, no, yeah. Right? Because we did this. <laughs> <laughs>